I have decided to set myself a wee challenge to make a white whiskey that is delectable, delicious, and smooth to drink without the need for maturation. Kind of tricky, but I'm going to make it harder. I've got a few more stipulations. How's it going, chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, this is Still It, and in my opinion, if I was doing this with corn, it, you have to know what you're doing, but it's definitely doable. Let's step it up another notch and use predominantly barley. That gets a little bit trickier. In my opinion, corn's just a little bit more mellow, easier to drink when it's new off the still. Not hard enough, I hear you say. Fine, I hear you. Let's make it even harder by uh, utilizing a whole buttload of smoked and peated barley in the grist. So, a white whiskey that is heavily peated, smooth, delectable, and tasty without the need of wood or aging. I think that's a challenge. And of course, it would be unfair for me to just taste it and tell you it's awesome. So we'll bring Erin in for the tasting at the end to let you know what it's really like. Time for the mash recipe. I'm making a 75-ish liter batch today, and we're going straight in with 10 and a half kilos of New Zealand peated malt. If you don't know what peat tastes like, buy a bottle of Laphroaig, it'll sort you out real quick, and you'll understand why this challenge is on the tricky side. To that, I'm also gonna add 0.7 kilograms of Manuka malt. It sounds like almost nothing. This stuff is insanely, insanely intense and a small amount goes a long way. If you're overseas and you don't have Manuka malt, uh, like we do here in New Zealand, you could experiment with any other wood smoked barley you can get your hands on. So we have the smoky stuff added in. That's the tricky side of things. Here is the first trick. And I've been using this a bunch lately. In fact, it's the reason I made this video, to see if oats are good enough to smooth out a smoky whiskey. So oats, 1.4 kilograms are going in. They're gonna add a bunch of mouthfeel. They're gonna give it a silky texture. They're gonna help us get towards the mouthfeel uh, and the unctuousness of an aged whiskey without having to age it. I'm also gonna add in 1.4 kilograms of Shepherd's Delight. It is a local uh, Gladfield malt that, in my opinion, has a interesting kind of dried, candied fruit, almost molasses-like flavor to it. And I think it adds a flavor that's similar to an aged, sherried scotch without the need for either of it. You're not gonna be able to get this probably anywhere outside of New Zealand. I'll have a hunt around on the internet and see if I can find something else that you guys could use in place, and I'll put it in the description down below. The whole recipe will be down there, so if you have any questions, go check it out. Of course, we need to crush all of our malt and get our strike water ready. I'm cramming this into a 50 liter mash tun today, so I'm starting with about 25 liters of water, and I'm aiming for a 65 degrees Celsius mash. Because we're pushing things on volume a little bit here, uh, I like to go low on the mash water at the beginning and then add more in at the end once I know exactly how much headroom I have in the mash tun. We don't have any tricky grains in here in terms of mashing, so a solid hour mash is gonna do it for us. Uh, mash out into the fermenter and, of course, sparge. I'm not worried about the specific original gravity, I'm more worried about getting as much sugar out of the grains as I can, so I tend to just keep sparging until I get down to around about 10, 15, 10, 20, coming out the bottom. All of that goes into the fermenter. I'm gonna be fermenting at 33 degrees Celsius today with a somewhat sneaky secret yeast. I'll be talking about this later on, don't worry guys. Uh, it's a test for something else rolled into this. Instead, I would suggest a M yeast, a Scottish distiller's yeast. I tend to use AM1 from Angel because I have it on hand. We sell it in the store. I can just grab a packet out of the fridge. It's easy. <laughs> but honestly, any M yeast will probably do you very well. I need to say a huge thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Manscaped, who have completely outdone themselves with the new Beard Hedger. I know, I know, people are gonna say, what business have I got talking about products like this? It's not like I use it, right? That's where you're wrong. 
Uh, I have been using this for some time. It's quickly turned into my tool of choice for trimming up the burns. I actually need to do it again, to be honest. They're getting a little bit long. This weird little bushy part around the side and taking the scraggly little bits off the bottom. The Beard Hedger features a titanium coated T-blade that effortlessly cuts through, you know, whatever you're rocking on your face. <laughs> And the zoom wheel gives you 20 different settings to adjust the length of the guard. I use that up here quite a bit. The Beard Hedger also has powerful lithium ion batteries that give up to 60 minutes of runtime. Great if you're on the run or you're just lazy like me and don't want to charge it. Even better, it has a triple LED indicator down the bottom to let you know how low you're getting on that battery. I got the Beard Hedger in the Pro Kit, which comes with a bunch of other products for looking after and tools for dealing with your beard. So, what are you waiting for? Go to manscaped.com and use the code STILLIT to get 20% off your purchase. Thank you, Manscaped, for sponsoring this video. Fermentation is gonna take four to seven days. It should ferment out pretty much dry down to a gravity of one. Don't stress it too much if your parameters are slightly outside that, it's not a big problem and it is going to smell absolutely freaking heavenly while it's fermenting if, if you like peat. If you don't like peat or you have a significant other that doesn't like peat, be careful. Make sure you're fermenting it outside because it's, uh, it's whiffy. Time for distillation, but we're in a little bit of a weird spot here. We don't have enough wash to do three stripping runs and get enough low wines to fill the still back up totally, but we've got too much wash to do a one and done run. Here's what I like to do in this situation. I'll run two stripping runs with about 30, 35 liters in each and reserve about five liters of wash as it is. Collect the low wines from both stripping runs and add them back into the still. And then add in the reserved five to eight liters of wash from the fermenter. This way, almost all of the wash will be double distilled, uh, but we've got enough volume from that extra five liters from the fermenter to make sure we don't have to stress about our elements being totally covered throughout the run, you know, having a decent amount of liquid in the still. Generally, with this kind of recipe, especially if I was going to age it, I'd just pot still it again. But because we're drinking it white and we're going for smooth, I'm going to add one plate into the mixture. I guess you could think of this as being kind of two and a half times distilled, not quite three times distilled. It's just going to clean it up a little bit more, give us a little bit more control with the cuts and give us a slightly more approachable distillate at the end. So bring the still up to temperature, load the plate, make sure that your water control is good for the D flag and the product condenser. And after a little bit of time of balancing it all out, start collecting product out the end. Of course, we're taking fours first and then we're taking heads. Time for the third tip. I found the point where I was absolutely certain that I had transitioned from heads to hearts and then I waited. I took another 15% more heads just to be absolutely certain that we don't have any impression of heads in the final product that's gonna make things jaggy, spiky, hot, more uh, alcohol presence than we need. Of course, we're running the still nice and slow. That's a good tip as well, but I think at this stage, kind of almost everyone knows about that. When I say slow, I mean slow offtake speed, not slow amount of power going into the pot or reflux going back down the column. But I have another tip for you as well a little bit less well known, uh, and that is to run the condenser a little bit hotter. If you have a copper condenser, uh, the idea is that by running the condenser a little bit hotter, we're allowing more interaction between the vapor and the copper, promoting more esterification, more knockdown of the sulfury kind of compounds, and overall we move the product from being kind of spicy and nutty across to being softer and fruitier. At the end of the run, we have a little bit of an issue here too. Because it's a peated whiskey, we want to get a bunch of that smoke, right? But going too far into tails can definitely impact the drinkability of a spirit without being able to change things up and hide behind wood and age. If we go too low into the tails, we get something that's not drinkable now. If we take too much out of the tails, we don't get as much smoke. Thankfully, with this recipe, that's not an issue. I got smoke pretty much from the beginning to the end, and it's, uh, 
It's intense, so I didn't have to delve down into tales too much at all. Time to proof the spirit down. We're not gonna cheat with this. We're not gonna go to like 35% or 40% ABV. Screw that, I'm aiming for 62% ABV to make sure that we're actually nailing this or to really prove that I failed. Uh, but here's another little tip, guys, and I'm sure anyone that watches this channel has heard me mention this before. I'm sure. But whenever you proof a spirit down, guys, give it time to come back together. It's kind of a traumatic experience for the spirit being proofed from you know, 85% down to 60%, and it just takes a little bit of time to all go back into solution, to mellow out, and become what the spirit actually is. A little bit of cheating, is that aged? I don't know, you be the judge. Tell me down there. Anyway, I think it's time to bring Erin in to taste the spirit. All right, my dear, you've got a blind poured spirit. You don't know anything about it. The only thing I'm gonna tell you right now is it's 62%. <laughs> so, it's not exactly low ABV. Take from that what you will. Have, have a taste and I don't feel prepared for thoughts. this. It's been too long since I've been out here. Whew. Why? <laughs> After I have a sip though, it doesn't smell so like shiny anymore, then it's better. Yeah, it's also like not late in the day and we haven't had any other drink yet, so, you know. Mm. It's actually really nice and warm. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good if you breathe it. <laughs> <laughs> it smells so much better now after having like two sips. It's weird how that happens better. sometimes. Eh? Yeah. It's also really so hot out here, guys. So you pour this, you let it sit for a little while and it's literally a glass full of vapor. Mm. It's New Zealand hot. It's not that hot. Yeah, it's like, I don't know, 27 degrees or something. Ooh. Hot. <laughs> to be fair, it's probably more like 30 in here. This is like a giant glass house. But mm. It's like super warming. It's really nice. It's not jaggy, eh? No. You just need two sips, three sips in. Before I lead you down any path whatsoever. I have no idea. <laughs> what sort of flavors are you getting from this? <laughs> warming. Warming, okay. It's a flavor, isn't it? Uh, if it was a whiskey, what kind of whiskey would it be? I'm scared to say it though. Because <laughs> I think I'm always wrong. It's Just say what you think, I don't mind. That's the, like that's the point wanna of be, pouring it It's like a wannabe, I love whiskey. The first okay, whiskey. Okay, there you go, yeah, like it's peated. Wannabe. It's peated, yes. Mm, peated. First I couldn't smell anything, but just like, yeah, what Bernie. The, yeah, yeah, Bernie. No, to be honest, I got smell. the same. I got the same thing, then, and I was worried that I hadn't accomplished my goal. But you're mm. right. Now that I've gone back really to it, nice. it's really it's mellow. Like super nice and warming. Yeah. And peaty for sure. It's definitely peaty. It smells like the whiskeys that I enjoy. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, but what color is it? There's no this stuff in it. Think of all the times that I've given you a new <laughs> whiskey and said, "Taste this." And I'm thinking, taste this and try and imagine what it'll be like in two years, and you yeah. just say it's yuck. Yeah. So why is it Does all... this taste like that? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't taste like that, it's good. What percentage would you guess it is based on how it's drinking? Like, would you think it's 62%? Mm, no, based on everything else I've tried before. I would guess in like the 50s. I wouldn't think it's 60. Yeah, right. The goal was to make a smoky white whiskey that's drinkable while it's white, without aging. Hmm. What do you reckon? Yeah. <laughs> it's really good. I was distracted by that fly, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's really buzzy. Yeah, it's really good. And I, I did it Definitely would want to proof it down. Yeah, I did it at 62%, so there was nothing to hide behind. And the idea being, be, and the idea being is if I failed the goal, hmm. then it would be borderline undrinkable. But yeah, I don't know, we can proof it down to whatever ABV you desire. What's the Freud? Uh, 40 or 42? We'll just do one of that, whatever that is. Erin <laughs> <laughs> uh, has the hots for the Freud, it's if really you hadn't good. realized. It is good. That was kind of cheeky of me to put Erin on the spot like that. I mean, let's face it team, blind tasting a spirit with thousands of people watching is pretty intense. So. Thank you, my dear, for doing that. Very appreciated. Uh, I do think that we kind of nailed it, to be honest. It doesn't, let's be real, it doesn't taste like an aged impersonation of a scotch. That's not what this is. But it's very drinkable. 
and it's approachable for what it is, a peated whiskey at 62% that hasn't been aged at all. The oats are giving us a little bit of body and smoothing things out, heaps of peat presence, a touch of the manuka in behind, and the Shepherd's Delight is kind of giving it an interesting, fruity, like I said before, almost sherry-like presence. Um, the biggest difference, I think, between this and an aged Isla whiskey is that the, the grain flavor is still fresh. It smells and tastes like opening a bag of grain, which is, that's quite nice for a change. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you've done something like this, let us know, tell us how it turned out, and drop your hints for making a smooth white whiskey down below. I'll catch you next time, guys. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya.